Yana Palakimano, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to give this first scientific talk. It's actually about 30 years ago that uh, I visited uh, Sombate for the first and last time. Actually, I didn't see anything of the town because I spent a night in the police station <laughs> to be accused uh, to cross the border to Austria illegally. Um, but uh, that's history, and uh, uh, on Thursday it took me about four hours to come from Heidelberg to Sombate, actually, via Vienna, so I think this was a record. Uh, today I would like to invite you to travel with me about uh, 10 to 6 years, from millions of dust grains to a plantable, to a precursor of a planet. And you also see that I have some subtitles, borders, gaps, and traffic jams. I think traffic jams are not unusual also in Hungary. If you go on a Friday afternoon from Budapest to Balaton Lake, I think you will experience a lot of traffic jams, and you will see that traffic jams are very important for plant formation. So why do I talk about that? Uh, we reached really a lot of progress in the last couple of years, and for instance, we in, could find out that in these disks, and you see here one of the disks, a uh, dark lane and a scattered light image, we could actually identify two magnesium-rich crystals like this one here. And I will show you some wonderful Switzer spectra of low mass stars. So I will talk about the origin of planetesimals. I also wanted to point out that it is important to know the opacities of dust grains because otherwise you cannot reconstruct the geometry of your, of your disk. And then I will also uh, discuss shortly that the dust is actually affecting the disk evolution directly and indirectly. And one example I give you in a second, that's the ionization degree. Imagine that your disk dynamics is driven by the ionization of the disk. We now know that there is a very powerful instability called the magnetorotation instability, which drives turbulence in the disk. <coughs> and here you see the ionization degree, and the fractional ionization actually, and all the cranes are well mixed, and you see here a dead zone a region where there is very low ionization, and that is caused by the fact that the cranes actually shield your cosmic rays, but they also provide surface. And the surface is good for recombination, so there's no ionization in the mid plane, and there's a dead zone, there's no angular momentum transport, and no turbulence. However, if the cranes start to sediment, and you see that in the second image, of course, you have full ionization in the disk, and everywhere the MRI can operate. So you immediately see that the grain physics is not just interesting because of planetesimal formation, but also because of the dynamics of the disks. It will tell you a bit about the observation evidence for grain growth, uh, both from infrared spectroscopy and from millimeter observations. We will shortly touch on the physics of grain growth, and then I will talk about brand new models uh, for planetesimal formation. What is the task nature has? So we start with submicron cranes in the disk, and we want to end up with 10 kilometer sized planetesimals, which actually start to decouple from the gas. And you see here the size order. This is about 10 orders of magnitude in crane size, or 30 orders of magnitude in mass. So this problem we have to solve, and I will talk about this phase in a second. I wanted to remind you that our observation tools have limitations. Scattered light is actually information source about the surface of your disk. You don't get any information from the midplane. Even infrared spectroscopy only traces the surface of the disk because the disk is too thick. And even if you go to mid-infrared imaging, you penetrate a bit deeper, but still, it's information about the surface. Only if you go to a submillimeter radio so this starts to become optically thin, and you can trace the entire disk. So that you have to keep in mind when I talk about different tools. This is a curve which everybody in physics can actually calculate. This is just the opacity of a grain from 0.1 micron to a millimeter. And you see here two resonances caused by the silicates. And then let's just make an exercise. Let's just increase the size of the grain. And you see here, at some point, the resonances disappear, can go back. It's about at a size of 10 microns. There are no resonances any longer. And you also see that the opacity is decreasing. And if we go further and further, 
Look here in the submillimeter, you have a power law behavior, but if you go to larger and larger cranes, you have cray opacity behavior, because the cranes are simply large compared with the wavelengths. And then you also see that the opacity is actually going down. And that's simply related to the fact that the surface to mass ratio is changing, and that means that you will have to expect less and less flux. So if you form a lot of planetesimals, at some point you will not see a disk any longer. Here is a diagram, and that actually shows a fraction of accretion disks over time. That's about 10 to 6 years, 10 times 10 to 6 years, 10 million years. That's the age of TW Hydra association. And you see here that the fraction of accretion disk is going down. If this is really a linear function, or if there's also time variation, that's actually an open question at the moment. But you see that after 10 million years, the disks are gone. More exactly, the dust gradation is no longer observable. So one has to be a bit careful with the conclusion because also the millimeter actually you see the same trend we found a year ago. So after this time scale, the dust disks are no longer observable. So there are two possible reasons. One is the dust grains are simply gone. And the other reason is that the grains have evolved into larger bodies. And because the past is going down, you don't see the disks any longer. There is now a direct constraint coming. Actually, all the exoplanet searchers were limited to old stars which do not have any activity because people saw that you cannot use the radio velocity technique for active stars. This is actually not true. You can work it out. And we did it first with this object, which is still relatively old, but no longer a billion years old, 100 mega years. And we found this Pharos, actually an instrument coming from the Landessternwarte. It's a 2.2 meter telescope, a planet, which has a minimum mass of 6.1 uh, Jupiter masses, semi major axis of about 1.8 AU, and a high eccentricity. I think this is actually very nice because that's a relation to the next talk where we will see interactions between the planets. So you see there are planets around young stars, and I can tell you that we now found a planet around a system which is actually 10 mega years old with a radio velocity technique. That's actually a paper which is just being submitted to nature. So let's see what we find out for crane growth. These are all the small cranes. I showed you these opacity curves. These are the large cranes. These are calculations. Now you can go to a telescope, for instance, to 3.6 in La Silla. There was a mid-infrared spectrograph, and you see indeed uh, different uh, shapes of your profiles, and these shapes can be interpreted as a crane size effect. You can also go to ISO, and you could mash up very bright sources, Herbig EB stars and the medium mass stars, and if you would have real scale here, then it would be in Janskis. The flux measured at ISO was in Janskis. And you see here a lot of structure, and what we found are these phosphorite and anesthetite grains, and it's actually amazing because they are really only magnesium rich. There's no iron in these grains. Why shouldn't there be iron in these grains? And actually, we don't know where the iron is. We don't have any information about the iron grains. Now, another surprise. We could also measure the spectrum of comet Hale Bob, and you also saw a lot of features. And all the features were again produced by magnesium rich crystalline olivines. Comets are primitive. In order to produce crystals, you need high temperatures. All the material in the diffuse interstellar medium is amorphous. There are no crystals in the diffuse interstellar medium. That means that the cometary material has experienced high temperatures, and the protoplanetary disk must have been mixed out to the regions where the comets have been formed. And in fact, you can now do the next step. You can measure T tauri stars, solar type stars. That's now possible with Spitzer. And these are spectra we obtained for a number of these objects. That is Anita Comiontis. And you see all these features uh, produced by magnesium rich silicates and for objects which have an age of about 8 mega years. What's really interesting, you can now do a comparison, for instance, for M4 star. And look. The flux level now, that's 100 times better than ISO, at least. And you get a wonderful spectrum for this object. This is M4 star, and you see the comparison uh, with Hale-Bob again. 
<clears throat> can even do a step, fur step further. I talked with George Rickey, who is one of the drivers behind JWST, and he said, well, one of the greatest challenges is to measure a spectrum of proud dwarf disk. It's over. You did it. That's the spectrum of proud dwarf disk and it's actually produced by a Hungarian, uh, one of our students who came from Konkoli Observatory. He's now in Tucson, a postdoc, and he produced these wonderful spectra, and they were published in Science in 2005. Same effect, larger cranes, crystals, even brown dwarf disks. Now, Chess Beichmann found a very interesting object. He found crystals in an old star. Actually, we observed a lot of old stars. We didn't find any features, no features at all. The simple explanation is that all the cranes are grown to larger sizes. And they do not produce features any longer. Then, the radio velocity guys went out observed this object and found three Neptune-sized planets. And that's actually the first system where you have information about the structure of the asteroidal belt, which is at about 1 AU, and the planetary system. Now you can start to do a calculation, the celestial mechanics calculation, can ask where can the cranes be in such a system. It's exactly at this radius. So now we start to work out the structure of planetary systems, the planets and the asteroidal belts. You can also start to combine high spectral resolution, or let's say medium spectral resolution, and high spatial resolution. So the idea is just to couple two large 8-meter class telescopes and do a, a you know, chromatic experiment, and then get the resolution which is no longer dominated by the size of your mirror, but by the baseline between the two telescopes. And the largest baseline is 140 meters, so you get a resolution which is equal to a telescope of a size of 140 meters. So what we did is we measured the whole disk, and you got this spectrum, and then we also measured the inner disk. And you see clearly a difference. The grains are larger, and you again see crystals. So what we now know is that grain growth starts in the inner disk and crystallization also starts in the inner disk. And that's the outer disk, and you see that the two spectra are really different. So we can now start to do an experiment with different baselines and can actually reconstruct the radial distribution of the material. I think this is really fascinating. Imagine we can tell you the radial distribution of the material. I don't want to go into the details. I just wanted to summarize again. The small amorphous cranes are the pristine material, and the large cranes and the crystalline cranes are the wolf material. But that's not completely true, because imagine that the cranes grow and start to sediment. Then you only see the surface, and what is remaining are the small particles. So that's one of the caveats uh, you have to keep in mind. <clears throat> Infrared spectroscopy has really limitations. The first limitation is you only probe the surface layer. And if there is sedimentation, you do not see the large grains, which are starting to sediment. Then, of course, you trace different regions depending on the luminosity of the objects. And, of course, for ground-based observations, you normally have a small wavelength region, and for space-based, you have lower spatial resolution simply because of the mass of your instrument. <clears throat> okay, let's now switch wavelengths. I told you if you go to the millimeter, you measure all the mass, and you can also measure the midplane. The exercise is very simple. For a Saturday morning, one should not have too much mass, but I mean, we're all physicists. So this is just the integration over the radial extent of your disk. Very easy. And then you assume that it is optical thin, that your optical depth is given by your opacity, that's a power law. And then you plug in everything, and you see that your flux depends on the frequency to this power. And for the diffuse interstellar medium, this beta value is 2. I showed you this power law dependence. It's 2. It's measured by Kobe, for instance. But if the cranes would be large, this beta value should be 0. So you just have to measure a beta value. But there is a caveat. If the disk is optically thick, and that may still be the case at millimeter wavelengths, you will get the same behavior. So you have first to make sure that the disk is optically thin. That's a recipe. And then you can measure your beta value. In order to do this, you have to resolve the disk. And you have to resolve the disk at a very long wavelength. 
So you can go to the VLA at 7 mm. It's very sensitive, provides very good resolution. And that has been done for a few sources, for T tori star, for TW Hydra, and for intermediate mass stars. And the results were always that beta is close to zero, or at least not two. We did that for 14 low mass stars, because now the sensitivity of the VLA at seven millimeters is very good. So we get a high sensitivity of 0.2 millijamsky, and we could measure all the objects at seven millimeter. We also measured the free free radiation in order to make sure that there is no contribution from free free radiation at seven millimeter. There is some, but not a dominating effect. And then you can derive your beta value. <clears throat> And that's the result. That is just the distribution of your beta values. And you see that's in the interstellar medium value. And most of the beta values are smaller. Then you can go through exercise and analyze uh, your SEDs. And the conclusion is that the grains are grown not to 10 micron, they're grown to centimeter sizes. And with TW Hydra, they even observed this effect at centimeter wavelengths. And we now can say that we can prove that in these disks, there are grains of a size of 10 centimeters. But that it will be a problem. <clears throat> you can also do SED analysis. Uh, you can measure uh, your disks at various wavelengths. Uh, you can do a radiative transfer calculation. And then actually, what you find out is that very often in this mid plane region, the disks are larger, but in the scattering lobes, the cranes are, are still small. We did that about 10 years ago with HL Turai and finds the same as has been done by Sebastian Wolf. There are a few fundamental questions, and I can only touch on these questions, of course. Is time the only parameter? You know that in a family, time is not the only parameter. There may have maybe a third body coming in, and you have a problem. Uh, what is a transition from photoplanetary disk to debris disk? When is the gas actually gone? I only talked about dust. Actually, the gas is much more interesting than the gas, uh, than, than the dust. So normally, after ISO, we, we have seen these wonderful schemes coming from embedded sources with deep absorption features to the mature gist, which have this comet-type spectra. Well, is this really true? Is this always true? One of the problems is, of course, age determination of the primary sequence phase. That's another topic. I have no time to talk about that. Another problem is that the transition period is very short from a protoplanetary disk to a debris disk. And then there may be environmental factors. For instance, we measured the spectrum of this object, and we could never make sense out of the spectrum. Then we went to adaptive optics measurement and found there's a binary. So we thought, well, the binary can do something for the disk structure. You can do that much better now. That's with the Ida Camiotis cluster. That's a nearby cluster, nine mega years old. All the stars have the same age. That is the advantage of these clusters. And you see here, the spectrum is a lot of processing, the spectrum is an inner gap, and the spectrum is no emission at all. Then we went back and analyzed all these objects which have no emission. All these objects are closed binaries. There's a one-to-one -one correlation between the close binarity of the objects and no excess emission. So now we know that if you live in a closed binary system, you may have a problem to form a planet around the binaries, not about the single components. Not, I mean, you cannot say anything about a certain binary disk, but about the circum primary disk. So binarity is important, at least close binarity. Let's go to TW Hydra. I think this is one of the most wonderful objects in the sky. Because it is close, 56 parsec, it is 10 mega years old in this transition period, and it's actively creating still, and there are a lot of information available, and uh, images from the HST, from submillimeter work, and there was this wonderful work by Nuria Calvet. She analyzed the SED, the spectral energy distribution. And she claimed there must be in a gap. The gap has to be at 4 AU, and of course, it must be produced by a planet. Well, this is an SED, and you should be careful. That is actually the structure of the disk. You go to, to the inner disk, and then you have the object thick outer disk. 
Eisner measured the K-band visibility with CAC, <coughs> and he found that the inner disk boundary, this boundary here, is at 0.06 AU. This is actually the inner radius, which is equal to sublimation radius. If you now go to the HST, that is the curve you get. That's the distance from TW height rate. That's the radio intensity. And you can do that from the ground as well. You can just use adaptive optics again. And actually, we did it, and we found that there is dust up to 0.1 arc second, 6 AU. Huh. Not good enough, because uh, we have to go closer. So AO and the 8 meter class telescope is not enough. Let's do that with interferometry. We used our mid-infrared interferometric instrument, and actually we succeeded to measure TW hydro, which is quite faint for interferometry. So we did it, and this is actually the shape of the visibility predicted by the Calvert model. And you certainly see that this <coughs> cannot be explained but by our observations. So now we do reanalysis. We again fit the SD very well with our model. We also fit our visibility. And the conclusion is that the inner gap is not at 4 AU, it's at 1 AU. And I can tell you that in this system there is a planet. I will not talk too much about that because this is hot news, but there is a planet in TW Hydra. And it's actually at 0.06 AU. It's very close to the sublimation radius. It's not at 4 AU. So let's go back to, to these transition disks. You see here normal SED uh, of an optic disk, and these are the so-called transition disks, where you do not have any emission around 10 micron, and which were normally interpreted as gaps. But the real question is, these are SEDs. This is dust rotation. Is there gas in these gaps, or is there no gas? Because normally you should have 99% of the mass in the gas, and not in your dust. So you should actually measure the gas. One of the possibilities is to do H alpha measurement. And uh, uh, we did that for a large sample of objects. There's a multi-object spectrograph. Uh, for instance, with this object here, and you found no accretion. No accretion means accretion rates smaller than 10 to minus 12 solar masses per year. So very low values. The best explanation of this sample is actually photo evaporation, not the planet, but photo evaporation. So your disk is actually destroyed from inside out by photo evaporation of other models or dust coagulation or dynamic clearing by a planet. And the life and the, this dispersal time is on a time scale of 10 to 5 years. So it's very, very short. Let's now get direct evidence for the gas. That's the object uh, which has an age of about 10 mega years. This is an HST image. And now you can do better than HST from the ground. You can do CO spectroscopy at 4.7 micron. And spectroscopy actually serves as a chronograph because there's no light coming from the star but there's light coming from the gas. And with a high resolution spectrograph plus AO, you are now able to resolve the Keplerian rotation curve in a CO line. That has been done in the millimeter, yes, but the resolution of the millimeter is bad, bad. Now we have a resolution which is very good. And what you see here, that is your Keplerian velocity profile. But what, what is even more interesting is that there is an inner cavity and the radius of the inner cavity is 11 AU. And I think this is actually the future here. Uh, we now have an instrument uh, at ESO, which is able to do the same cryos, and we will see many more of these results coming in, in the next years. <clears throat> I just wanted to point out uh, that the gas is really important for the planets, because if the gas is gone, there's no migration any longer. So imagine that you have migration from the outer to the inner disk, and you have at the same time photo evaporation. You have two competing mechanisms, and it's important which mechanism wins. That's just the calculation show, showing this uh, migration effect. But for the migration, the presence of gas is very important. I talked about crane crows, and the question is always, do these particles stick? And these are the different mechanisms for producing relative velocities. And uh, 
we can work out a few numbers. Uh, for instance, we can work out the time scales. It's uh, easy to understand that cranes grow faster in the inner disk because of higher surface density. And the setting time for larger cranes is, is, is shorter than for smaller cranes. Just to show you the velocities, and that's an important information, if you just uh, want to find out the relative velocities, for the small cranes, it's millimeters per second, centimeters per second. For the large particles, of one meter, it's 100 meters per second. You could still imagine that two particles colliding with a centimeter per second may stick. But take a boulder 100 meters per second and smash it onto the wall, I mean, that will not stick. So we have a problem. Actually, there are a lot of experiments which now prove that there is no problem for the micron to centimeter size grains, particle stick. We know a lot about grain physics. We know how the particles agglomerate. That's actually an electron micrograph of such an agglomerate. So this problem is practically solved. We also know that if the crane start to sediment, you will have a change in the foreign threat uh, energy distribution. Though we, we see observation effects as well. Now let's come back to the core accretion model and to two problems in their early phase. I told you we have to form the planetesimal, then you have a slow accretion of the gas. Later, after energy is dissipated, you have a runaway gas accretion. There are a lot of problems with the core accretion model which are related to the time scale of this uh, phase. However, these problems are now more or less solved because you can move the planet and you will always find material. But I think there is no longer a big issue here, but there are two big issues for the early phase. One I already mentioned. If you have large relative velocities, 100 meters per second, your meter-sized borders will not stick. So you have a barrier you cannot cross. And the other problem is, uh, as soon as you form a meter-sized body, it will migrate into the sun. And the time scale for migration, 1,000 years. That's too fast. So you have two problems which you should solve. And that was actually the reason that Walter Eich and Ward proposed another way. They proposed that the crane sediment, and you have gravitational instability in the dust layer, which forms immediately uh, planetesimal, and you can write down a nice dispersion relation, it's not, not difficult, and you will find out what the critical density is. But then, just a couple of years later, whether he already mentioned, uh, well, let's be careful here, it may actually be a mistake to go to this instability because we do not understand the other process well. And then finally, Biden, Chile, and Cassie actually showed that the gold reward mechanism did not work. There are a number of reasons the very small turbulence velocities which are required can never be reached because you have this uh, dust layer above the gas layer, there is shear induced turbulence, and I will show you an uh, example of, of this Helmholtz cavian instability. Let's now switch gears and let's, uh, I want to show you a few numerical simulations and I think this is appropriate for this environment here. And I will show you that turbulence in a disk can actually help to form planetesimals. And there are two possibilities. You can actually increase the crane density uh, even in the passive this by turbulent vacuum, and then there is active streaming instability, which is your traffic jam. So let's uh, do a small calculation. Let's take two million dust particles and add these two million dust particles to the gas. And uh, let's take a box with a magneto rotation instability and run a number of 100 orbits. And this is what we do here. So we start with a homogeneous distribution, and you certainly see that uh, we get an inhomogeneous distribution. The density of the material is increased by a factor of 100 locally. So it has a very strong correlation between high gas density and high dust density. The dust density goes up. And it could be that the densest regions now undergo gravitation collapse in the dust layer. There's no longer your sedimentation, but locally concentrated uh, dust, uh, dust particles. So the question is, what if there is no global turbulence at all? 
uh, can the dust grain then sediment freely to the mid plane? No, they can't. Uh, because you have the Kelvin, Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And that's just shown here. That is the vertical distribution of the velocity. And the dust feels a bit of a headwind because of the pressure. The grains do not feel pressure. And therefore, close to the mid plane, there is a mismatch between the gas and the dust velocity. The gas moves subcapillarian and the grains move capillarian. But if you have grains, of course, they interact with the gas. And then the gas also moves capillarian. And if you go out, the gas moves subcapillarian. So you have a sheer layer between the gas uh, with different velocities. So now you can also do a simulation. That's a 2D simulation. We had 400,000 dust particles, this quick resolution. Took us many hours of supercomputer time to do this calculation. Now you see, again, the dust density is very non-axisomatic. At some point, you see wonderful Helmholtz cabin instability is growing. And I think this is a really turbulent disk. It's not a laminar disk any longer. It's shear driven. So let's now do the next step. Higher dust densities. And let's ask the question, is there cavitation instability? Now we have a code, the MHD code, plus cavitation instability in the dust. This is really difficult. So let's now do a calculation. And you see local over densities. And we wait a few seconds. And let's see what happens. Material sheared away all the time. No planetism is formed. Yeah. Nothing happens. Nothing interesting. Sheared again away. Here. Here it comes. Do you see this guy sitting here? So this is no longer sheared away. It stays stable all the time. It's now gravitation is stable. The dimension is about 100 kilometers. It's a size distribution. The first question you ask, but what about the size? It's a size distribution already, stays together. It's a planetismal. And the relative velocities between the cranes is very small. There is no shattering, nothing. So you have a very efficient mechanism to produce a large particle. Now, I think that's the first time that this has been shown by calculation. So what I what does this have to do with the traffic jam? I told you that this is a two-stream instability. Let's imagine you have two lanes in your highway, and you have a coupling between the left and the right lane, because a stupid guy, you would say in Hungary, who crosses from the right lane to the left lane is uh, simply too slow. I mean, then, of course, you have a traffic jam because this BMW has to stop, and then 100 cars behind the BMW also have to stop. Sometimes you have a catastrophic traffic jam. That's actually the same what happens here. You have a flow of dust grains, a flow of gas. You have a coupling force. If you have no coupling force, nothing happens. But if you increase the coupling force, then you get a traffic jam. You get a very powerful instability. You can even write it down analytically. So this is the physics behind this effect. You get a traffic jam in your put a planetary disk. And if the density is high enough, I mean, if you have enough cars sitting there, you have a gravitational instability, everything collapses. You need a lot of cars to do that. <clears throat> so what we did is actually, we now find evidence for micron-sized grains. But I think even more interesting, we find evidence for centimeter-sized grains, which should migrate rapidly. Spatially solved data are now becoming available, not only by HST and AO, but now by interferometry. And the next step will be to get images by interferometry. This is not still possible, but that will be possible, uh, at least uh, with the VLTI. And then uh, I told you that the dynamics of this gas crane multi-component system remains really a big challenge, but we, we are making progress. I just want to, to show you that uh, there will be a possibility, actually, to, to measure these gaps created by the planets. This simulation we did a while ago with Sebastian Wolf, and you see here, this is his inner gap. And then we use the IMA simulator and ask ourselves, how long do we need? And this is a four-hour integration time. That is a very long baseline for IMA. I mean, it will start with a smaller array, but I mean, eventually, we will have these large baselines. 
And then we will be able to see if there are really gaps created by these photoplanetary disks. So that will be the next step coming very soon because I will be there in five years. Thanks a lot. We did a lot of travel. We arrived now with planetesimals, not with planets. I showed you one planet figure and I told you that it's now possible to search for young planets with a radio velocity technique, something which people didn't believe, but that's possible. And I also told you that there is a planet in TW Hydra actually found by the radio velocity technique. Thanks for your. Thank you very much, Professor Henning. And I have to say to my guest, guests that I try sometimes to repeat this excellent talk in Hungarian, maybe not so excellent as you did it, but I try to say what the content the first talk was here. Köszönöm szépen. Megköszöntem professzor Henningnek ezt a csodálatos előadást, és én közben néztem Gotthard Jenő bátyánk hüvelykujját. Az mindig akkor mozog, amikor valami nem tetszik, de most, mintha ott belül úgy dörzsölte volna az ujjait, hogy ez neki nagyon tetszett. És megígértem önöknek is, és Henning professzornak is, hogy alkalomattán, és az alkalom valószínű sokáig nem fog váratni magára, én el fogom önöknek mondani, hogy mit hallottunk itt, akik ezt magyarul, hogy úgy mondjam, idegen nyelven nem értették, mert tényleg csodálatos dolgokat hallottunk itt, és tényleg méltóakhoz a társasághoz és ahhoz a pillanathoz, amit mi most itt ünneplünk. Uh, dear colleagues, the stage is open. If some questions or comments to this talk you have, please. Or somebody from the remote station. Professor Balaj? Actually, I have a question. And actually, it causes two parts, but they are closely connected. So the, the role of metal, so metal content in the grain grows. So you mentioned just in the, at the, the beginning something, but later on was practically nothing. No, that's, I, I think it is a very important point, the abundance of, of, of metals in the, the, the metal, because it strongly influences the grain growth. And then if we look back in cosmological times, this might be, it's a very decisive factor that the grain growth story in the early, say, larger than Z equal one, is a little bit different as seen, for instance, the dusty quasars and so on. So the main question is, so if we look back a little bit in cosmological time, how the things are changing, which you said quite nicely in our local environment. I mean, as you may know, I mean, there is uh, in fact, there has been in fact found that uh, planets are normally detected around stars which are more metal rich. However, one has to be very careful with this statement because this statement is based on the present searches around solar type stars. If you go to lower mass stars, this relation is already questioned. So if you go to the M stars, it's no longer so obvious that this is an important effect. If it's true, I mean, there is an alternative picture for planet formation. It's a gravitation instability in the gas believed by a person in the local environment of DTM, Alan Boss. Uh, I think it's not the only person who believes that this works. And in this case, you cannot understand this metal uh, correlation. If you go to earlier times, I mean, lower metallicity, people did transit searches in globular clusters and actually didn't find planets and claimed that this is, again, evidence for the fact that you need high metallicity. How we, however, even in this case, you have to be careful because, I mean, there's a lot of dynamic relaxation going on, and now people are trying to start to investigate this as a function of radial distance from globular cluster centers. In my view, I think the best way would be to go to the Magellanic clouds and to use stars there to do radial velocity uh, work. 
You may think that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. At the moment, it's impossible. I mean, you cannot do radio velocity studies of an 18-magnitude star. I mean, it's very difficult. Even with flames, it's, it's not possible. But that will come. So I think you could do radio velocity studies of objects in the Magellanic Cloud, and then you can try to, to answer this question. I mean, this is iron stuff. I think it's really interesting because, I mean, this is a very abundant element. And we don't know where the iron is. I mean, there was this prediction that iron is in iron sulfides in the disk. There is no iron sulfide in, in these disks, I can tell you. But, I mean, from Spitzer, we can completely exclude that there is iron sulfide. So the iron can either be in, in iron grains, and then this has a large effect on the opacity of your disk. So this is an open question. Nobody knows where the iron is, actually. So the old Pollack models don't work. Uh, <coughs> okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank again. you.